motion to approve tonight's agenda. David? Second. We're meeting the policy presentation tonight. Seven point three. We have already talked about process. Okay. I second. All in favor? Gary. Aye. Aye. Favor? Yes. Okay. Our next item on the agenda for tonight is our board recognition. So at this point in time, I will turn it over to our superintendent, Ms. Swan, to um, get our board recognition process. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So I'd like to invite Nicole Arbery and a few of our students from the senior high up to the podium. And while they're making their way to the podium, um, I will share that uh, Shauna Kate usually is here, he couldn't be here today, but we've been talking about the great work of the student government at the high school. So our students and Nicole are going to be sharing some of the priority and areas that they've worked on this year um, and give a board a sense of student leadership at the high school. Hi, so my name is Nicole Arbori. I'm uh, one of the math teachers at the high school and I had the opportunity of becoming the student government advisor this year. You know, it's been a very popular club in the past through the many years at the high school. And, you know, COVID definitely threw a turn through all of the different events that we couldn't have over the last few years. So it's been our goal to bring it back and rebuild this group. And tonight I have Caleb Regno, senior, our current club president, Daisy Famer, our next year president for Stugo, and a very active member, Junior Mia Yenter. So they're just going to give you guys a brief uh, overview of what we did this year and our plans for next year. All right, so I just want to start with the beginning of the school year with homecoming. Um, the student government is very involved in planning that entire week and everything that goes into it. So we start off with a spirit week for five days and we come up with different um, different things to dress up as and do different activities within the school. Um, as a club, we vote on these together and we try to re reflect what we think the students in the school would dress up as and would enjoy. Um, we also do a pep rally at the end of the, the year, or sorry, at the end of the week at um, the football stadium. And at this, we have a bunch of fun games and activities for all um, the students to do in all different grade levels. It's a great event. It's at the end of the school day, it's outside, everyone loves it. Um, later that night, then we do the Potter Cup, which we organize, and this is an event that everyone loves because the girls get to play football, which we get to be for flag football this year, which is great, um, but the boys also get to be cheerleaders. Um, this is a great fundraiser for our club because we charge admission to get into the game, and this helps support other events that we do throughout the year. And then on Saturday, we help set up for the dance and the, um, the great night that we have that day. The next thing um, we partake in is the um, blood drives that happen at the school. And we participated in two this year. One was in November and the second one was in April, where at each we had members of the student government um, work the sign up tables and to help get students and teachers both involved in this great cause. And then at the actual blood drive, we had students um, help sign in and just make sure everything ran smoothly, everyone was okay. And um, yeah, it was just a really great like event to take part in and for student government to help with because it's just a really good cause and to get everyone involved in the cause. Um, along with homecoming, we also have two other spirit weeks. We have the winter spirit week, which is the week right before um, holiday break. Just like um, homecoming, we again go on days that we think will be most involving with the students that everyone will want to participate in, to dress up as, and um, have events. Unfortunately, due to COVID, um, our pep rally that we were planning for the day before um, holiday break um, was postponed, and that led us to have our really fun spring fling, which was just the last week in May. Um, we again um, came up with days to dress up as to get the whole student body involved. Um, and 
that on that Friday, we were able to get inflatables for the students and teachers to participate in, and we were able to also get um, food trucks. So um, we had fun, eat, and it was just a really fun time to be outside, just like stress free right before the fall. It was really nice to see the students getting involved once again and um, activities that we didn't have to have, you know, social distance and masks, seeing those smiles on their faces once again. And we're hoping for next year to bring back some of the more traditions that we've had in the past, such as the talent show and just more student body led activities um, and things like that. And then another thing that we did in the spring of this year was uh, we did a lot for our teachers during Teacher Appreciation Week to show how much we love and support our teachers and everything they do for us. So um, throughout the week, we had, uh, or the week before, sorry, we had Stugo members write individual note cards to every single teacher and faculty member in our school, and we distributed those on Monday of that week. Um, we also did an ice cream bar in the teacher's lounge, which we had students serve for them, which was an awesome event. All the teachers got together, had ice cream, they were so excited. I loved it. Um, and then later in the week, we did a bingo day. And after school, the teachers came to the cafeteria and we did bingo for them. So it was a great week to just show how much we love them. Um, as for next year, we just want to focus on rebuilding student government as it was in the past, and including more activities, more involvement, um, hopefully more diversity into the club, and just making it the best we can. Any questions? Any questions? I just have a couple of comments. First of all, thank you very much for being here tonight. I know it's a very busy time of year for high school students, especially with all the events and exciting things that are happening. But also I'd like to say thank you for your leadership in the high school. I mean, I'm kind of taking notes right here of all the things that you have done and are continuing to do, and the list is ongoing. So. Thank you for your continued leadership and making our high school uh, a great place for all students. You know, and I'm just thinking about all these activities that are back in the play this year. It's just, um, as, a, as an educator myself, that's very exciting to see those things happen. And those aren't possible without your leadership and getting kids involved. So thank you for all that you have done and will continue to do to support the high school. We really appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you. Yep. We appreciate you guys having us as well to share everything that we've done this year. We really truly enjoy these updates. It's really important. It's great to see students back at our board meetings. And um, it's great for us as community representatives to hear and see what our students are doing and what's going on at the high school. So thank you so much. Any other board members? Anything else? I no, appreciate all the work you do every day for the kids and for the school. Thank you. I bet you that ice cream bar was a hit. <laughs> I love ice cream. That <laughs> must have been a hit. Yeah. yeah. So just another another way of you reaching out to teachers and showing your appreciation. And uh, those things go such a long way. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The next item on the agenda is privilege of the floor. And during this time, members of the public may address the board. Remarks should be limited to two to five minutes. The board will listen to input, but not respond, except to refer any specific, any specific concerns to the superintendent for follow-up. Questions should be answered within a week, if possible. So um, we do have one speaker tonight, Mr. Don Bardeen. Uh, please be sure uh, to give your name, address, and phone number, uh, and our board clerk will record that information. My name is Donald Bardeen. I live at Six Ridge Meadows Drive in Spencer Court. My phone number is 585 414 9987. I'm just going to read something I'm going to give it to the board to uh, I'd like a response to it. Uh, a goal of our education system is to graduate students to be productive 
I'm going to give you two choices. One, United States of America citizens with an awareness of the global community, or number two, global citizens with an awareness of the United States of America. It's not a play on words, there's two separate things there. And I'd just like you to please tell the Spencer School District residents which statement above you most agree with. Also, does the school board or the school district have a code of values? And if yes, where can they be found and what are they based on? Now, uh, the last time I was here, I didn't get a chance to uh, fully complete everything I, I wanted to uh, cover. I'm going to try to take advantage of a few minutes here to kind of try to go back and readdress that. And this goes back actually to a, a question that I had asked back in February, I believe, and I had a response on March 8th from uh, Mr. Hutton. And then questions that I asked at the subsequent board meeting when I returned from Florida, I have a response from Mr. Kincaid. But there are certain parts of, uh, that I want to address a couple of things, but going back to Mr. Hutton's response to me back on March 8th, I believe it was. He specifically said, and I'm going to read his words, uh, school boards are not required to respond to speakers' questions. And I put a circle around the word speakers, and I, I interpret that as they don't have to respond to the people they work for. Uh, he also said that um, my questions were arbitrary. And he asked, if you had an end goal or overarching purpose for your appearances, please communicate that, as we are still unclear as to your direction or views you want to share. Uh, what I wrote on my response to that, uh, I believe it was April 26, which Mr. McKay responded to, he didn't cover this, those specific questions that Mr. Button had asked. And what I had written on April 26 was the following. You asked about my direction or views. I do not believe that our country or the Constitution in which it is founded is systemically racist. I also believe that the New York State CRSE, Cultural Response, Responsive Sustainable Education Framework, is fundamentally flawed. I invite you to ask me for clarification on this and suggest an open format where both you and any member of our community may engage in open dialogue concerning this subject. My questions are not arbitrary but fundamental in establishing the foundation of our educational system. My end goal is to identify and have removed from our school district policies and programs that do not align with the basic values of our community. Uh, I think one of the things that we need to do in this community is we need to differentiate between public, which is community controlled schools and government schools. I do not believe the Spence Court School District is a government school, it's a community school. But I believe a lot of the responses that I have received in the past lead me to believe that we're fundamentally always going back, this is what the state says, this is what the state allows, this is what the state mandates, this is what, look at the website, look at the, the framework, et cetera. I think we need to come back and start to think more locally. And we need to get, we need to find a way to get many more of our residents involved in the school system and the school district and helping you understand how the, what the community feels. Uh, and I realize it's not an easy thing to do. I, I went to the last election and I'm not sure what the total number of uh, people that voted. It's very hard to establish that. Uh, there weren't, it, it didn't appear to me that there were uh, a lot of people who voted that could have. We need to find a way. I'm going to try to first figure out a way to get as many people involved in the election system as I can. That's it. And I've still got 26 seconds. And I'll try to get out of here. Before I work, up my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bardeen. Okay, the next item on our agenda for tonight is the consent agenda. If we have anybody here from uh, participation in government, our consent agenda are items, uh, some business items that we get this information in advance. Um, the week prior to our board meeting, board members go through it, we read it, um, and then if we, and we have other uh, questions about any of the information in the consent agenda. Um, we can ask those questions before the meeting, and sometimes we ask the questions here. 
So uh, what I'd like to do is see if we could uh, have someone make a motion to approve the consent agenda. These are all appointments that were Those made. Are on, they're on the website today. Oh, okay. Today I'm sorry. I had a busy day at work. Yeah, we need to include the agenda. So. So I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda with attached to that. Yep. Yep. I second. Any other questions? All in favor? Gary? Yes. Oh, didn't see him. Opposed? Okay, fine. Thank you. Okay, next item is our Board of Education reports. Um, I just, I just, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. I apologize for that. Um, I do just want to take a moment in our consent agenda um, was the appointment of two of our new administrators. And I would just ask that Suzanne Gaugh and Samara Case stand up. Suzanne and Samara um, will be joining our instructional office. Suzanne um, as our Director of Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Director, and Samara, our Director of Humanities. So I wanted to just welcome both of you ladies to formally to the Spencer School District, and we're so excited to have you be part of our team. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, next item is our Board of Education reports. So just a quick, um, a couple of quick updates. First of all, I'd like to say um, congratulations to our academic award recipients. I know that that um, recognition ceremony took place last week on May 26th. So a big shout out to all our students that have um, excelled in academics here at Spencer Fort High School. Um, also, I just want to say congratulations once again to our retirees uh, that we acknowledged tonight at the retiree reception and some of them couldn't be here, but I think the number was 35 this year, you know, a total of 35 so good luck to all our uh, employees that have made such an impact in our learning community here at Spencer and I wish them the best of luck. Um, also, um, coming up June 9th. This Thursday, we're partnering with, partnering with the fire department. We'll be working the concession stand for those of you that are available from 5 to 7.30 p.m. Um, and also, I would like to say uh, congratulations to Gary Bracken for completing his uh, role as the Monroe County School Board President for the last year. I went to that annual meeting um, on May 25th, which was last Wednesday. And Gary was recognized there along with Sherry Johnson, as we all know, who is retiring. Um, is he continuing his role or? No, it's term? a one year oh, one so year seat. Oh, yep. is it, is it somebody else now. Yep. Oh. Yep. yep. So Amy Bozak, who oh, is yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. She is she's the new president. Yep. Um, that's all for me. Awesome. I just got a couple things. So I did attend the academic awards. Um, high school band had performance. I want to mention Joe Pambili and Ben Osborne. Uh, they were also at the Memorial Day Parade and uh, the concert band and the drumline performed at the Memorial Day um, as we walked by Ben's house. <laughs> I'll just add on to that that the Jazz Board Band is performing at the Rochester Jazz Fest on next Tuesday, or Tuesday the 21st at 4 15 p.m. On Gibbs Street, right in front of the Eastman Theater. It's the night of our next board meeting. So I but you can still make go. it. I'm going to squeeze it and I thank you. Yes, <laughs> I will be there. Um, I'm very excited to see the jazz band uh, perform out at an event like that. I think it's really exciting. Your daughter plays jazz band? No, my daughter doesn't play in the jazz band. Well, I just like the jazz band. <laughs> yeah, I would say, well, fine. I will be there as well. And if anybody was attending the jazz concert last night, I'm going to embarrass him for a minute, but um, right back here is Ryan Donnelly. He played a absolutely gorgeous fuglehorn solo that you would have to hear to believe. I will embarrass him by saying that I have listened to it multiple times. It was amazing. It was gorgeous. So can't look beyond your ears. Yeah. Just wanted to give you a shout out. It was really remarkable. So congratulations. 
combined senior and will be graduating, so he will be missed. But come see the jazz performance next week. Thank you, Leah. Mr. Maselli. I'm in the envious position that since I'm a latecomer, I don't, I'm not assigned to any 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 groups at all. We can fix that. I mean, I, I tried, and apparently that's only something that can really be set up at the organizational meeting. So I have two more meetings to be able to skate, and then I'll be on to whatever committees that I sign up for. But for now, I don't have any committees. It's a win. All right. Awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah. So nothing. Uh, not much to say. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. All right. Let's move on. Uh, our next item on the agenda is our superintendent's report. So I will turn it over to our superintendent. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, as the board knows, we are going to be having our public hearing of our code of conduct and our safe plan um, June 21st. But I'm going to ask Darren and Jonathan if they would join us at the podium. I'm going to uh, review both of those plans. I think you usually like to present it as one at time. All right, um, thank you all for having us. Uh, I know uh, we had a scheduled uh, public hearing for this. Um, however, uh, given the change in schedule, uh, we thought it was a good opportunity to at least uh, have an initial discussion about some of the proposed changes. Um, and that way we can bring them back to you at uh, the formal hearing. Uh, then the changes or any changes or changes to the changes at the formal hearing on the 21st. Um, so as our standard practice, we usually combine the safe plan with the code of conduct um, in these presentations. So I'm going to let Darren start off with the safe plan and a little discussion about um, what the safety committee and the facility department has been doing this year. Thank you. So the safe plan is uh, legislation that uh, came into effect in 2000. Uh, and it's the Schools Against Violence and Education Act. Uh, and so we've been participating ever since. And each year uh, we uh, uh, give uh, a task of ours to uh, go through the, uh, the plan and make updates if necessary. Uh, we have committee members uh, of, uh, this year uh, with us in the past as well. Uh, safe, the SAFE plan requires school boards to adopt and amend yearly industry wide comprehensive multi hazard safety plans. Uh, going over crisis intervention, emergency response management, recovery, as well as, uh, as you mentioned, the district code of conduct. Uh, these plans uh, include uh, uh, some general items and uh, policy and procedure updates. Responding to threats of violence, acts of violence, um, specific threats, uh, and also how we communicate and contact uh, law enforcement and families. Um, some of the routine changes are uh, updating the personnel, uh, telephone numbers, equipment, inventories that we have, uh, and any just general uh, errors and updates that are necessary. Uh, there's a new section this year as it relates to the pandemic response. Uh, so you'll be able to see that uh, section, that, which is required uh, by, uh, to us by New York State. Safety committee, uh, we meet on a monthly basis. Uh, review a lot of uh, things that are happening sometimes in real time, some things that we uh, look forward to or, or projecting in the future uh, that we would need. Uh, we talk about things that have happened in the past and try to, you know, make lesson learned decisions, recommendations. Uh, some of the accomplishments we've made throughout this past year um, are, are continued uh, conducting individual breeder uh, training uh, through our AI phone, as well as the Raptor system that uh, most people are aware of the Raptor system uh, to our schools. We've added a security guard position uh, that is split between the middle and the high school. Um, uh, so that's really good. Um, we conducted routine security reviews and walkthroughs for all, all buildings, uh, obviously our six schools, but as well as the administrative building, 
uh, our transportation building and our favorite shop. We continue to account for all uh, emergency drills. Uh, we record this data. This data is uh, submitted to SCD. Uh, and so it's an important process that we make sure we communicate with each building uh, administrative team as uh, getting their reporting in, uh, how they've been doing on their uh, emergency emergency drills throughout the year. Aaron, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yep. So, did you record the emergency drills? Don't you said you record them? Not the uh, drills themselves, oh, but the data. Got it. Right? The date. Cool. Oh, right. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, the date that it happened, uh, the time. Sure. It took, yeah. 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 Uh, we've worked with Alteris, a uh, company um, who uh, specializes in uh, school safety and security, uh, and uh, full safety and security assessment. Uh, uh, across the district, and they provided some really valuable data for us to uh, kind of extract and, and decide what uh, best fits us and what we can uh, chase after the next year and as well as uh, the next few years. Um, one of something I'm very uh, happy about is that we have installed uh, just about 40 cameras at the high school, interior and exterior cameras at the high school, in addition to a new server. These cameras replacing many uh, of the old analog of the Helco system. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, we just had a training yesterday with high school administrators, and it's, it's just, it's been well received in terms of their ability to see areas, their ability to kind of uh, you know, support what they do at the high school level. Uh, participation in the district threat assessment team on a regular basis, this is uh, it's just once or twice a month uh, that we have these uh, scheduled meetings. Um, uh, our level of security is increased at uh, sporting events um, uh, at the varsity level, uh, and we continue uh, to make efforts uh, with our partnership with Swoop, long term partnership with uh, Swoop, um, really helped us uh, be able to make sure that we uh, keep our security in place for these events. For the 17th year uh, running, we received the highest level school safety award from our insurance carrier, uh, Utica National. Uh, continue the routine testing, uh, the breeder alert and lockdown buttons, uh, as well as the uh, filing of our uh, building emergency response plans uh, with us on an annual basis. So, uh, so Darren and I, as co-chairs of the safety committee, um, we've been tasked with a lot related to security this year. This is kind of a, a quick summary of what we're going to be working on together over the next six months. Um, onboarding a new senior security supervisor, that was a position that I uh, advertised, uh, if you will, to uh, admin council and others um, prior to the budget being passed. Um, we're going to prioritize the implementation of the Alteris recommendations. Um, Alteris takes a very layered approach, and they really don't want us to take put all their money at four eggs in one basket. They want us to pick a number of items to help raise the overall level of safety and security across the district, as opposed to just really focusing on one or two things. So Darren and I have met, I think, three or four times um, and with our retiring director of security channels to, to talk about some of these and we get bogged down on you know what can be implemented, what has a cost, what doesn't have a cost, what changes policies and buildings. So there's a there's a number of things without really getting into those specific two that we're going to focus on, but then implementing um, those that we can implement on a short term basis over the next few months. Um, one of one of Darren's projects is upgrading and moving the security office at the high school. Mr. McCabe was uh, gracious enough to help find a space for that. Um, so we'll be making some enhancements there that hopefully um, elevate some of the response levels and provide a central location. Um, Mr. Olson's current office is Burnaby, right? No, it's at, it's at the high school still, oh. but it's quite small. Um, last year, at the beginning of last school year, Mr. Olson was uh, he moved his office to a full-time office at the high school, but it, it's it's too small to meet the students. It, it's, but Toby it, was the Burnaby before. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Toby, oh, yeah, yeah. Burnaby, yes. Um, but with a lot going on and you know staffing difficulties with school, it was a much better idea yeah, I guess, uh, to have uh, Mr. Olson moving over to the high school. 
and then future hiring of the director of security, another position uh, that I had mentioned prior to the budget. Um, I've learned today that uh, we anticipate posting that sometime next week, hopefully, um, so that we can make some progress down that road. Um, so then we'll be onboarding uh, senior security supervisor within the next week uh, prior to Mr. Olson's um, retirement and then director of security as things play out. Who we anticipated um, start date for the director of security? Uh, it would depend. Um, I mean, if if we're if it's a retired individual, the civil service title requires a certain level of police experience. Okay. So if we're pulling a retired individual, it could be much shorter. Okay. But if it's pulling someone out of active service, there could be a delay. Okay. So it really is going to depend on who the candidate is. Thank you. Um, before we transition to code of conduct related stuff, are there any questions for Darren and I regarding um, the safe plan, <clears throat> the changes or anything that we've done this year? I got a question. It's more Jamie. I'm sorry. <laughs> so for the director of security, that, that's a civil service exam Correct. type of position. Mm -hmm. So people take the exam and they get a score. And then can you tell me real quick how that works when you or hire someone that's a civil service exam? Is there, is that is that 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 I don't remember if that one's um, competitive class. Do you remember when we went through the process? I don't recall. I don't think there's anything. I don't know if it's, some of the positions are not competitive. Okay. Um, they're non competitive, so they just have to meet the minimum qualifications. Okay. So then we'll take applicants. As long as they meet the minimum qualifications, right. they'll be approved by civil service. Okay. And you get like, you, they will send you three or four candidates. And then well, if it's not competitive, there's not a list to pull. Yeah. Okay. We can just post, got it, receive applicants, right. make sure they meet the minimum qualifications, and, and then that's who we can interview. That's got correct. It. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, code of conduct. Uh, we had a, a few questions that uh, we were talking about um, as uh, about the revisions that we presented to the board. Um, the code of conduct itself is really, as we said, part of the safe plan, just helps maintain order, sets ground rules, really puts families on notice of, of in, in this, what we have now, a very traditional view of you can't do this, or this is a, this is a potential violation, here's the potential penalties. Um, every school district uh, for amendments to the code, as we discussed when we amended the code in March, we removed the appendix with the pandemic related provisions. We have to have a public hearing prior to that. Um, and then uh, once it is ultimately adopted, we have to uh, upload it to SED within 30 days of adoption. The same rule applies for the SAVE plan. Uh, the SAVE plan should have mentioned that we'll get, um, once we have the public hearing, that will be sitting in the superintendent's office so that members of the public could come and review that. That stays up there for 30 days and then that gets uploaded to SED as well. Um, all of those requirements and then the building level plans will hit um, August, September. I'm going to get to the contents of those. So for the changes that we've put forth right now um, and then we reviewed with the uh, safety team, uh, safety committee as well as with, uh, with uh, Ty and uh, Ms. Swan. Um, so starts off with the introduction. As you remember, maybe you might remember from last year, we did a number of changes related to uh, restorative practices. We had conversations um, with uh, high school administrators, Mr. Chalzi, Mr. Silvera, a number of teams that worked on incorporating some language changes and, and some structure changes to portions of the code of conduct. Kind of furthering that, we've incorporated a paragraph towards the beginning um, from the BOE policy on suspension. That was a, a policy that the board adopted. The paragraph uh, was a suggested paragraph that came from the equity committee. So I kind of just really just lifted that, put that into the code of conduct because it seemed like a much more welcoming verbiage than the very legalistic structured verbiage that was in that introduction. And then a paragraph on restorative justice, uh, kind of guiding what I use the word was the guidepost, setting guideposts, if you will, for starting down that road, finding a way, if you can, if certain actions or conduct is appropriate for the use of the restorative justice model. Not every action will be appropriate for that. Not every, you know, sometimes there, there's a give and take with consequences versus using the restorative justice model. Um, so that was 
a change just to the introduction. Um, what we also did, uh, I believe this was a recommendation from Alteris, was to include the tip line um, in the code of conduct itself so that there's families are on notice, they have the opportunity to see it, and some language about reaching out if you have if to report violence or other activities, you can reach out to our anonymous tip line. Um, it's just really just letting families know that another method of getting that out there. We've also posted it on the district website on the homepage, which was a recommendation um, from all parents. I'm sorry, Jonathan so, posted the code of conduct or the tip line? The tip line number. Is tip line managed by a different entity beyond Spokeswork? No. So that's our number? Yes. It's checked by the director of security. I'm going to make the suggestion that a email address is set up to function as another outlet for someone seeking help because it's well known. Well, first of all, kids don't use phones. They don't call people. And secondly, it's well known in this environment that when you have an 800 number, ever the dialer, the person that originated the call, their information always is included. It's kind of well known and there's a, a lot of publications concerning junk calls. So I, I'm going to make a recommendation that an email address is also published along with it. Prior to COVID, we have had some internal discussions regarding transitioning that to a different format. Um, one of the reasons for keeping it in the toll in the phone number was its anonymity and the information that you mentioned. What I was saying is say it's, not it's not anonymous. It's not anonymous. If I call that 1 800 number, you're going to know exactly who the it, caller it, it's was. That's exactly how it works. And that's why a lot of people are afraid of it. It doesn't so, send an email, though, doesn't your email? That's why I'm suggesting. So, you, you may, the, the, my first question was is whose phone number is that? Is it Alteris's or is that ours? Who, may, who runs that, that program? If it's Spencer Court, that number, the, the originating number, who dialed, person who dialed that number, you're going to get their phone number. That's why I suggest it as a, if everyone knows this, as an alternative, or in, in addition to that, I would, I would suggest leaving an email address. So you send an email, that's more anonymous? There's junk emails all yeah. over the place. Like, like go see email, you can do something. Yeah, yeah, people, I mean, right. it's built right in your Not my but whatever. Yeah, let's build writing out. You can hide your email anytime. Yeah, um, put a different name on it. The yeah. reality is, if I pick up a phone right now and dial that 877, like like they're going to know exactly who sent that call. They it, can't backtrace an email, though, if they want to do That's a lot more complicated. Okay, I don't disagree. That's a lot more complicated. I mean, look at your inbox, look at your junk folder right? for, for emails. But in all seriousness, if I were to pick up the phone right now and call that number, all you got to go back and look at the bill for that, and it's going to say who called it. Because that's exactly how the 800 numbers work is the person who originates the call doesn't pay the bill the person who receives the call and owns the 800 number pays the bill so yeah it's it's kind of widely known because there's been a lot of publications on it considering there's a big fight and especially in government on these against junk calls like hi your social security number has been disabled or how's your car warranty all those calls so it's kind of really been out there so a lot in the other is kids don't call phone numbers Mm -hmm. So, just a suggestion. And Mike, you're under the impression that more people would call, knowing that it was anonymous completely. I'm under the impression that you're, you're, that's your assumption. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So, yes. or I said I'm under the assumption that people would be more likely to send an email than call a phone number in today's day and age. I guess is that what you said? Yeah. Yes. Either one has its pros and cons, but we're just trying to get people as many outlets as possible. I think they were willing to text information, but it's even worse, you know. Yeah. Email's a little we, cumbersome. And we can have that discussion yeah. too, but let's not yeah. have it now. But okay. there, there's actually a lot of things in place. For example, you're going to start being able to text them every one person. It's already going on in a lot of the country. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff happening. But that's another conversation. Okay. There's another conversation I want to have sidebar before I left a million years ago. There was a strong, there was a lot of discussion about uh, code of conduct slash um, ethics hotline slash email address to address some of our internal challenges personnel wise. And uh, it wouldn't be included in the code of conduct because it would be for internal uses with staff here. And that's something that uh, 
guess, judging by the blank stares, that hasn't been implemented despite all our conversations. So we'll have that conversation at a different time. Um, the that's included in the code of conduct or could be included in the code of conduct. Um, so um, prohibited student behavior, this one generated a little bit of interest. So um, the change itself was a proposed change to a subsection regarding the, the prohibited conduct of possessing a weapon. There was a sentence authorized law enforcement officials and the only persons permitted to have a weapon in their possession while on school property or at a school event. So, while it was a very discreet instance, this was the result of the change of the student hearing that we had here in the district where a student was found not guilty of possessing an exacto knife on school grounds that the student had removed from an article. So the BOCES attorney, who was the hearing officer, determined that if that essentially the exacto knife is a tool. So if the teacher is providing a tool to students, it can't be a weapon because our code of conduct says only law enforcement individuals are allowed to possess a weapon. Therefore, it negates the fact that the exact knife could be considered a weapon. I'm sorry, I'm not following that. No, I'm not even... you, know, you know what's interesting, Jonathan? You've made this argument, and believe it or not, I've just heard this argument in passing from a neighboring school district that I don't think they're a member of BOCES 1 and or both these two and i can't speak to the specifics of the outcome that you're citing but what you're describing to me is something that they go through many 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 times and in this case there's going to be a big disagreement of what's a weapon because in that school district a weapon is pretty much considered anything you can do harm whether it's a pen yeah, you know, a pair of scissors yeah, it's all about intent so i really wonder exactly how the attorney actually played his cards there, played his or her cards there, because I know for sure that in a neighboring school district, that would, with the situation of the exact like, would absolutely be a weapon, and the person it would be absolutely be a knife, and they would be they'd be out just because it happens, unfortunately, very frequently in that district. So when I went back, I had uh, Marcy was able to locate the hearing memo memo from the hearing officer. The family did not have an attorney. The family made this argument on their own. But the BOCES attorney was in line with the idea that the exacto knife was a tool, not a weapon. It was found in the student's bag. The student was still found guilty of possessing a number of other contraband. The student still received a suspension. But with respect to the exacto knife, the student was the only one who could testify, or the only one who testified and testified that she had essentially extracted it from the art room and forgot it was in her bag. And in this case, our administrator could not point to anything in the code of conduct that said a tool provided by a teacher could be considered a weapon. I don't, oh, hang on a second. I don't understand though how that change hits that point. It removes, it removes the argument. Do we have a definition of weapon That's, in the code of conduct? Because that seems to be more of the, the issue than who can possess it. Because the problem here is intent. It doesn't okay. sound like the student intended to do harm with the exact right. No, I'm just in with society, with the societal and the political environment that surrounds us with some of the things going on right now. Anything that that's any anything at all that can be used as an intent with a weapon. I don't care what it is, a paper clip, a knife, a pen. It needs to be treated as such. And I, I'm not I don't, don't want to open up any. I, I, I'll characterize everything as a weapon. Because I'm not going to open up any doors for anyone. In in, be, in most cases, just about anything could be considered a weapon. And the administrators in the num when when I was giving trainings on this, they were trained not to worry about intent. Yeah, I can't, you I can't prove, intent you can't intent. improve a student's intent because those students don't have to testify. So you need to be able to walk in there and present the case that the individual was in possession. That's it. So if the bag was searched and it was found, they're in possession of a weapon. Now, a weapon could, as I've seen, uh, knitting needles. Student brought in knitting needles and was using them to tattoo another student. So whatever you want to charge, whatever the, the, the administration charges that individual with, in that case, the district charged the student with possession of a weapon. It was actually engaged in something. 
was there intent to harm? I would say no. There was no intent to harm. They were tattooing. Sounds like how does the modified language right. get us into a better position though? Because if I'm in the family, I'm still going to say it wasn't a weapon. It was a tool. What is? What do you mean possessing a weapon in around school property? It wasn't a weapon. This is after watch after hearing. Uh, this is what I just found today from Brockport that this is in their code of conduct. If this doesn't work, we can we can consider other changes to help clarify. Okay. Yeah. But removing it simply just means possessing a weapon. That way, the our district administrator at the hearing can just simply say they're in possession of a weapon, whatever that weapon came from. Yeah, but it doesn't resolve the scenario that you're talking about where the family argued that it wasn't even a weapon in the first place. But only because of this sentence. That's the only reason their argument won, is because we had a limitation on the on that. So, so, so we can add other, in, we can add more. So, so proposed change just for that say possession of a possessing a weapon and just leave it at that allows us the most flexibility and would also take care of us in the situation that you you talk about. Our code of conduct has lots of you know bladed weapons, those things are included as weapons. But the code really talks about you know these are examples thereof, but we've added essentially a definition that time and whenever that was in that was that predated me um but at the same time we, we can leave it we don't have to if you don't think it's going to address the situation this is i know mr Maselli said that it, it happens all the time i think i only saw it once or twice in the districts that i was working oh. where is the language that we're that we're proposing to strike where did that originally come from? Because I've seen that exact language word for word in many other codes of conduct. So I have to assume it came from a model code of conduct. Somewhere. So that's where we get to these, these mandatory minimums. So when I first started here in 2017, Mr. Milgate asked me, suggested that I reach out to the New York State School Boards to get their model code of conduct. Their model code of conduct, which I received back in 2017, has this paragraph word for word, including the number two days. That's why that is in at almost every district around us. They all have the same penalty because it all came from New York State School Board. Now, I recently read through every decision posted on the commissioner's website that cited Education Law 2801, and not a single one mentioned what the minimum suspension should be. So when I did some more research, I found a 2018 version of the same code of conduct from New York State School Boards where they started incorporating more restorative justice language. And they lowered this to one day and they lowered the next the next one to one day. This was five days. So without any reasoning behind it. So if you look though at this. Down here, it's a it's minimum of two days, but the principal has the authority to modify the minimum two day suspension on a case by case basis. The same thing as Right. Are we moving on to talk about mandatory minimums now? Though? No, but I'm trying to get okay. to the history. All of these gotcha. things have come from the New York State School Board's model policy 5300 model code of conduct. I found another one this afternoon from 2011 with which referenced a lot of the things that are prohibited in our district, as well as this paragraph, the same two days, the same language, it's just been going on for so long. And in that year in 2011, they actually um, increased the drug penalty from like 10 to 20 or five to 10. It was going up at that time, which we'll talk about later as intended to go down. So that's kind of where the history of those came from, um, as to where this language, I don't know, yeah, it's everywhere. probably the same. If everybody's got that, the hearing officer manual from Monroe Chubosis recognized the result of that hearing and actually recommends you adding a paragraph into the code of conduct specifically to address, to differentiate the fact that a student who is in possession of whatever they call them implement a sharp object like that if it's used in the classroom it's acceptable if it's taken out of the classroom it's a weapon i don't know if that holds up 
legally, but that's their recommendation for boards to put into their code of conduct. So, Jonathan, this is something thank you. The word weapon, that's the million dollar question. To me, a gun's a weapon. I mean, we could talk all night, but a gun's sure. a weapon. If a kid has in his book bag a plastic from a restaurant with a knife, a spoon, and a fork, and the plastic we all get, we could take out, right? It's his book bag. It's to be considered a weapon. So you, you can't jack a kid up at, at a sport event, go through his book bag and say, I see a fork knife from school with a salt and pepper thing in there. It's a weapon, you're done. I don't think it's a weapon. So it's, I don't know if we need to go and clearly define your weapon such a broad term, but there are certain things that are weapons, there's certain things that are not. I don't think any object, because to Mike's point, it's about intent. But let's see, you get a kid, you open his book bag, he's got a plastic knife, and you can't say, you're done. I think it's unfair. I just do. So, I mean, I don't know where we're going with this, but some dialogue has to be taken with truly what's this? I mean, a gun, a hand grenade, a, a, I don't know what, but. It's just it's it's so I think I think the some of the intention will go to what Ms. Swan and, and Mr. Zinkowicz and I have talked about is working next year towards making the code of conduct a little more reader friendly. This is very legalese. The reason for this is the student hearings. That's it. Mm -hmm. Is to make sure that individual that, that someone gets suspended. It is very broad. Like New York State law defines a knife as over two inches, over two and a half inches. But regularly, districts suspend for small sure. blades. So it's it's a common thing because their codes are written so broadly that essentially suspension is the only avenue. Yeah. I, I just I just think you know um, I mean you, you could make a list a mile long. Truly, it's a weapon, and you could do fifteen things long items. We're going, I mean, maybe we need legal to say <laughs> that these are the things we need. It, it, Hey, hey, Jonathan, can I just, I, I, I've been listening to this and stuff and I, and I, I you know, we're, we're not going to be the ones to litigate this at some point in time. If there's a suspension because somebody determines something was a weapon, then that goes into the, the appeals process or whatever it has to go into. But we're not going to litigate it through our policy. We're going to say weapon and you know, somebody will figure out if that kid was going to use it as a weapon or they were using it to fix their car. I, I, I don't think we can get that detailed in our policy. Well, I, yeah, I mean, it says in most codes of conduct, and these are examples, including but not limited. Sure. So, and that's, that, and that's fine. If you want to put it, you know, these are examples up to and including but not limited to. I, I'm okay with that too, but I I don't think you're gonna we're not gonna cover all the ground of possible weapons in our policy. That's gonna be kind of left up to the judgment to some degree of the administrators, and then if it goes to appeal, those folks that take on the appeal. So my my whole point to this is the way it stands now in the before possessing weapon period. That's highly subjective and allows the district. Um, as much wiggle room as they need to do the right thing to protect the safety and welfare of the students and the staff. I don't want any, anything else that might complicate that, limit that, that bullet for possessing one, anything that would could potentially take the teeth out of that or make an exception. I want nothing to do with it because when it comes down to it, there are a million scenarios. And we just need the flexibility to do what's real. And, that, and that's what I was saying in my initial my response to the response to the response that came out in the email of this. I'm perfectly comfortable with possessing a weapon, period. And just give us this, and giving you guys the flexibility to make those determinations on a case-by-case -case basis to keep us all safe. That's dead, just to sum it up. Okay. Everyone else? We'll have more opportunity because we're gonna hold the public hearing on the 21st, so we can revisit this either through emails, additional conversations, um, as well as I can you know, have more conversation with Ms. Swan and cabinet, um, and then, when we get to the public hearing to bring back, you know, whatever the change is or not making the change. Um, this one didn't generate any questions. This was really just adding in the possibility and notifying families that a student could lose their access to district computers and internet because it wasn't in there. 
is in the AUP, but not necessarily outlined as a, as a potential penalty in addition to suspensions. Um, so we kind of talked about the mandatory minimums and I, I explained where some of the, the language came from. Um, but what's interesting um, in our additional dis discussions this afternoon, talking about the mandatory minimums, when you look at what is considered a violent act that would be um, subject to a mandatory minimum, That's what we All right. Uh, a ninth grader who verbally threatens and intimidates someone. That's in the code of conduct as a potential uh, a violation um, and included, but not limited to a, a violent act. That's where my mind was going initially to, you know, a high school student who might engage in behavior. But it could also apply to a third grader who scratches another student. They would get a two day minimum suspension under our code. Not under the last sentence. That's, but that's, is it really a two, is it really a two day minimum or is it? Well, zero? the statute says we have to have a minimum. Well, it's, that's it's, why it's we have a minimum. Of an, a number, isn't it by law that we have, it says in but, New York but state no law, you have to specify a minimum. We could say zero, because that's essentially what we're saying. If, if this is, if we incorporate restorative justice, the principle could have minimized it every time. Correct. But so we're the saying statute zero. says that we have to have a minimum set forth in our policy. Mm -hmm. To set a minimum of a zero is nonsensical. But isn't that where, well, arguably some people would say that discipline and restorative practices are going towards moving away from some of those into, well, in this case, a very broad application that applies to everyone with the initial language. So if you go to zero, it's not a minimum, it's not in existence. In my opinion, Correct. you go to zero. I'm just, it's not existing. It's not a minimum. That means you go to a minimum of something. Zero is not something. Zero is not existing. We, we can leave a, a number. We could change it to one. The way New York State School Boards changed it to one um, in, 2000, in their 2018 example when they started incorporating. Well, it would be nice to get some feedback practices. from staff what they think an appropriate minimum would or could be, and if they're comfortable with the minimums as they are, or if they would like to see them reduced. My only, my only, Lori, my only caution there would be if you're talking to, um, if you're talking to elementary, first grade, second grade staff, versus uh, a ninth grader. 10th grade staff, I, I think you're going to get different kind of comments on that and what, what they think is okay as a minimum. Um, if we want to set a minimum, but have that authority to modify that, as the last sentence says, just set a one day minimum, if we have to set a day at all, and then we go from there. But I, I don't, I don't think asking staff, we're going to get so we're such a wide ranging kind of opinion on this um that i don't know that it's going to be much informative you know i think having a minimum gives the people in charge a safety net because they can be like well you did that to this person and why is this person get more or less than me if you have it it acts at the very least you're getting x if you take it out this person got two for that i got one for this it's going to create a lot of so at the very least, it's like, okay, at the very least, you, or most at least, you're getting X number of days. Could, if it's two, it's two. So I might say, I'll give them four. The okay, may say, I'll give them seven. Don't know. But it can't be completely because that's like, like I said, you got zero for that. You got four for that. It's not fair. You know, I think you have to have a, a four somewhere. Well, that's zero. the case, though, regardless of discipline, right? That it's not going to be consistent. Meaningful, right? Regardless, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, that's the case regardless. I mean, you might have one student who gets two days, another one gets three. So setting the minimum to me is not the, that's not gonna solve that argument. My question though, really, in terms of instead of time, is that the proposed was to remove a minimum completely, right? And now my understanding is that you can't remove a minimum. So what you're saying is that our language would have to say, there is no minimum suspension. I'm just trying to figure out how we stay within law and the law I says found, you have to state right. a minimum. The, the 2801 says that you need to have a minimum. Correct. My argument, and when we were looking at this, is that minimum could be zero. 
So there was no guidance. I could find no guidance from SCB saying that any number was appropriate or you know. Right. But so we would have to put it in the proposed policy then, but the minimum would be Thanks. zero. Oh, essentially. Is that okay? We could yes. we could put that's that's what I'm asking is that to remove the language completely takes us out of compliance with that law. So I if we're gonna send it to zero, then that's that's a right. different discussion about what the minimum is. Mm -hmm. But right. the statement I, I, still needs to be in there. If we had a statement that said the minimum was zero. I would argue that we are in compliance with the law. Okay. That's, yeah, that's I would, I guess. Say in compliance with 2801, our minimum is zero. I think that's not a very bad message. I disagree with that. I'm sorry. And, and, and that's disagree. where. Well, then the discussion about what the minimum is. Right. I'm and, not saying I agree or disagree with zero. What I'm right. saying is that we do have to have a statement about what the minimum Like can't to, to me, zero is not a minimum. Yeah. To me. That means you get something. And I think 82 is being very extremely generous in terms of violent act. That could be a punch in the nose or bring a bomb. Yes. I, I mean, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. A student yeah. with a disability who bites a staff member, hits or bites a staff member. Mm -hmm. I did that hearing. One district wanted to suspend the student for 10 weeks for, for hitting a staff member. It was a BOCES staff member. The BOCES employees said they wanted him back in two days because of his behavior or why he was in that program. A mandatory suspension would dictate a, a stronger measure for certain acts which may not warrant. Again, it's intent, discretion. This is really about just allowing discretion to the administration to make that call, if you will, using further incorporations of restorative justice. That was yeah, all good. the intent. We, we already have an issue with our SWDs and some um, discipline issues and stuff that maybe were like a little bit over the normal and stuff. So I, I think, you know, if you, you go back, I love that whoever said that, you know, one second grader scratches another, is that a violent act and deserving of a two day suspension? No. <laughs> so um, I, I think we have to have a bare minimum and allow our administrators to make good choices since we hired them to make good choices. And just as a reminder, in very violent acts that are going to supersede a five day suspension, those are going to become a superintendent hearing or long term right. suspension. Jonathan, I'm I, sorry. Go ahead. What's, what's the, the kid brings drugs to school, right? What's the, what's the suspension for that? Do we have our policy anywhere? Mm -hmm. What is it? Uh, student found guilty as a result of the hearing will be suspended from school typically for five to 20 weeks for a first offense. So if that brings pop to school, he gets that. If he does a violent act, which we can discuss, he gets two days. <laughs> two days is the minimum. Two I days mean, was just the minimum. I know, that's that's my point. Point. Yes. And, and yes, even this five to 20 weeks, that was five to, was brought down. Mm -hmm. When I was, regrettably, when I was doing some of these hearings, students were traditionally suspended for 20 weeks at a time, mm -hmm. easy, drop of a hat. I did it mm -hmm. six times a week. Mm -hmm. And that's not always appropriate for certain students. No, it's local. not. So no, it's not. In this day and age, with the legalization of marijuana, the vaping and everything else right. going on, five to 20 weeks, is just yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll get something, whatever that something is. But my point is, is the prior conversation, we were thinking going from zero to two. It tells compared to anything like this, they're bringing a pot or a vape or whatever. Yeah, that's not about that. It's illegal, it's not violent. I, 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 sus yeah. I suspended over 1,400 yeah, kids sure. in eight years. And I only one time had crack for yeah. a really, or a number of times, drugs. some hard drugs who really, you know, where districts were scared by that kind of, you know, stuff in the building. The legalization of marijuana is changing the interpretations and the outlooks by parents and kids and allowing, the, removing this minimum specifically, even if we didn't touch the other one. This one is important for discretion and keeping these kids in school. Because right now you end up with a suspension on your record, you know, five, 10, 20 weeks, 
you get a program of support, you come back, you still have this huge suspension on your record, even though you're really only out of school for a week. Yeah, I, 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 Jonathan, I'm 100% with you. This, you know, this, to put a blanket five to 20 week suspension on a kid that might have a something on his possession or made a stupid mistake and had a drink, you know, in the back parking lot during lunch, that is just, that is so old school that it it is it, it I can't even imagine doing that to a kid at this point in time. I agree with Gary on that. That view was suspended every now, let's be clear. Right. We, and we all know that there's a vaping issue at the high school. If you suspended every kid that got caught with a vape for you wouldn't have, I mean there would be three kids a problem <laughs> with attendance, be this to say. So but that is the problem. That's right. Yeah, so I'm saying you'd like to you. I I struggle with this every week mm -hmm. when I have to make a superintendent hearing. Um, I struggle with this one specifically of children who may have made a choice to abuse a medication, and I have to because the way the code of conduct is mm -hmm. suspend them, and that's the last thing that their mental health. Yeah, I don't have any issue with done. this. You know, so so when we look at, at that language, when we're thinking about the code of conduct, and I think like it goes to you, how do we create a code that's broad enough that allows us to individualize response to kids? I'm interested in a more subjective approach by our leaders where we can ready make or personalize the let's say the punishment but the improvement plan for the student on a case by case basis right yeah you look you look at the totality you look at the totality of the student and what they've done in the past and and you make good judgment calls and that's why we have good administrators to make good judgment calls i don't i don't see these minimums making much sense at all quite frankly May or may not have sometime in the recent past sent my student to school with, with Advil. 20 weeks? Right. Five to 20. Five to 20. Oh. Yeah. I think that I, I, is there a board member who disagrees with the removal of the minimum for this policy? No. Okay. No. I think we're all good. So this one's good. Okay. So that was it. So we can come back on the 21st. We, however, we work the formal hearings. We, Darren and I will make a presentation. There'll probably be some changes to some of the recommended changes to the code of conduct based on our conversation and further working with uh, Ms. Swan. Um, so if there's nothing else, I can let Darren. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Jonathan. Work on that. Thank you. Thanks, Darren. That's policy today. Um, Next one is policy 8440. It was included in your board materials. This is what Mr. Zinkowicz presented on at the last board meeting. Um, don't have a, uh, necessarily a presentation for this one. Um, but you saw this policy and the language changes during Mr. Zinkowicz's um, presentation last time about the work that the homework committee has been doing and, and these changes are reflective of that. It's just a matter of last time was a presentation. This time has to be a, if it's, if it's gonna be approved, it's gotta be a formal first read, which it was not last time. So it's a procedural step, right? If this is an interest, um, otherwise um, there would be a second read if there were any additional changes that we were talking about. Um, Mr. Zinkwich, I don't know if you wanna add anything. Okay. Anybody have any discussion or concerns about that? No. Nope. Okay, so can I have someone make a motion to um, approve policy 8440 homework for street? Forgo. Yeah, I think you, have to, you also have to forego, forego the second read. And forego the second read, thank you. Motion for that. <laughs> Say it. They're going to repeat it. I make a you, motion you that it, we approve it. policy A440 on the first read and four on the second read. Second? I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? 
Gary? Yes. Yes. Thanks. Oh, 84 40. So, uh, sorry, not 8440. The 7 and 8000 series. And I know I keep using the same title. We're almost done. I probably keep saying that too. Um, but there's essentially some stragglers that we have to pull together. Um, policies that have taken a while for us to consider. Um, for example, Jamie and I met on a Title IX policy. We decided we had to send that off to our attorneys specifically to talk about timeframes and a standard of evidence. Way a little bit more than we're comfortable making recommendations to you without some additional um, evaluation. So 3420, um, first up, generated, uh, Mr. Jabardi had a question about protected classes. So we do have protected classes indicated in other policies, but also protected classes is kind of a, I guess it's a, in my mind, a term of art, but maybe that's just because I'm an attorney, because it, it, it does go towards, you know, religion, race, so all of those categories. And what's interesting though, in this, policy, which I didn't notice, is the first paragraph it uses protected category, right. but the rest of the policy uses the wording protected class. Right. So in some respect, we could almost get away with just changing the word category to class mm -hmm. so that the definition is, in, is inferred by the references there in the first paragraph. So okay. somewhere in our policy that does state what the protected <laughs> class or categories are. So like our EEOC policy, our Equal Employment Opportunity Policy for Labor Laws, outlines protected classes. Right. It doesn't exactly use the term protected class, right. but it indicates the categories, I'm going to go back and forth, of the individuals who are protected by that under both federal law and New York state law. Did you find value in putting it in there? So it's right there. Are we? Go ahead. Um, in this one, 3420, it, it, it seems like a very broad general statement of non-discrimination and harassment. It, it, I don't think it would hurt, but we'd have to figure out which protected classes go in there, or we would have to make a general statement of a protected class is a, is a group or category of individuals who is protected under New York state or federal law. Yeah, that's something we've done with our, I, mean, I don't really have to have it now myself. You know what I'm saying? I mean, <laughs> You're looking for a definition of protected. Yeah, there's like, there's like seven of them, or like the, the five or six, like, right? Ish. Ish, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so. federal law may differ from New York State. If New York State yeah. has included weight, that's not a federally protected class. So there's there's some differentiation between the two. So we have to figure out what we were going to put in there for that. Yeah, and then it gets difficult in case um, classes are added to become protected. Like in the future? In the future, mm -hmm. yes. So you, leave it, so you would see the word protected class or protected category. class or category, which do we, we I would class. prefer class, yeah. but, but I mean, it could incorporate uh, Gina, the genetic information non-discrimination act. That was a simple one. Yeah. You were yeah. On that one? Okay. So uh, the, you know, those in that could be a protected class, your, your genetic information could be, I'm not saying it is right now, but if it goes down that road, we wouldn't have to amend the policy it is because hard. the policy would not include any limitations. <clears throat> well, is that a gaming change? But as I read it, it says protected class, class category. Uh, what are they? I know it's so, religions and, and gender and stuff like that. I think I may be wrong about this, but I'm going to guess that our employee handbook possibly describes what some of the protected classes are. So if it's not necessarily set forth on our it, policy, Jerry. An employee would know whether they were part of a protected class based on a handbook. Our policies. We don't have a handbook. We have our policies. So, so this is this is meant to be the employee handbook, the policy. Between our policies and our bargaining unit contracts, that we don't have handbooks. And regulations. Oh, but 3420, that series is more a community based interactions with the community. If there's a policy in the personnel series that outlines the protected class under labor law, that would fall under there. If there's a non discrimination for students, which I think there's an anti harassment student related policy, that might have a separate, just you know, 
include DASA, include references to those protected classes. But at that point, it almost anybody could fall into a protected class. See, for me, the fact that there's dialogue makes you think that it needs to be more clear in there. I mean, you're an attorney. We have eight, 12 people here, and we still can't really nail it down. No, so. well, I mean, here's the deal. So in New York State, do you know what I mean? Race, color, national origin, religion, sex, disability, age, citizenship status, genetic information, that's mm -hmm. federal. And then in New York State, you have a bunch of others. Do you know what I mean? So then you're gonna add gender identity, uh, family status, military status, you know. So we're not gonna try and list them, I hope. Is that, yeah. is that the point? That's my, yeah, yeah. not list them. Okay. I mean, we don't list them. Make it an addendum or something that can change easily. So I think that was the only question about 3420, 6121, there was a comment about um, sexual harassment uh, trainings. We do in Spencer Court have to take an annual training at the beginning of the year uh, through our training modules, similar to other school districts who use the same GCN. Yeah, I think so. um, 7250 was a, uh, that's the policy on dropouts that I said had very harsh Language. Oh, sorry. I'm yeah. already moved to the. I'm doing it chronologically on the yeah. stage. Um, sorry. 6550 leaves of absences. Not really uh, questions about that or graduation options. Uh, the policies at the bottom of the slide you're looking at: postgraduate or student and or student tuition, involuntary transfer students, and dropouts. So, um, Spencer Port only policies. Involuntary transfer of students, if it's disciplinary, it's going to be related to either education law 3214 or other measures that are protected in other ways set out legally. And then dropouts was a spend support only policy, and there was no eerie one suggested policy. It was just a, seemed very harsh. And I, I just, I don't know, I just didn't care for it in a way. Um, but I didn't see a reason. And when, when I was reviewing it with instruction office staff, there was, we didn't see a, a reason to keep that. Uh, but I know the question was if there wasn't there was one sample of it. Well, no, that's, we'll get to that. That comes down to a um, confusion of policy. Mm -hmm. I was looking at all the policies in OneNote, which were not consistent with the policies that were sent by PDF. So there was no drafted policy, right? So for 72.50 in OneNote, mm -hmm. So I was asking that question, like I actually spent a considerable amount of time looking for similar policies at other districts or because I thought VIA had just been inadvertently left off. But when I looked at the PDF on email, I realized that it had been deleted. So we do need to have a conversation about the way that we can communicate, because I will tell you it was a considerable amount of my time and I know before we've had a conversation where we had put comments in OneNote and you had just checked email. So I don't care what system we use, but we do need to have right. a, do we do it by email? Do we do it in one note? Because right. then I was reviewing policies that you had already edited, but I didn't see the edits and- I will do whatever you want to do. I agree, I'm with you, me too. I just want us to- to convert all of those to PDF. Yep, really yes, I would just like us to decide. I do like email. Email. When you send it out with the attachment, I like that. Version. See, I do. So, not. You know, really. Do. <laughs> so like we're, we're going to talk about that once we get through this. So let's keep pushing on with this, and then we're going to talk about what process that we're going to use. It's going to be consistent, so that two or three of us aren't going to one place, and two or three of us aren't going to another, and then it starts the next because Excellent. that's we need we we need to do this more efficiently because it is very important work. So I'm going to have you press on. And then we're going to talk about procedure. Whatever. Yes, I bring that up just so you yeah. don't have to go into your explanation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No uh, we'll try to finish up. Title one. Uh, I. So title one, no questions required by federal law. We have requirements that we have to meet for our two title one schools, and and those are really limited to certain programs. So we really added the word school slash programs because it doesn't cover all of our school buildings. Um, the selection of library multimedia materials, use of television, kind of antiquated policies could be, I think it was 8351. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when I was meeting with instruction office staff, mm -hmm. 
it could be removed. It, it could be kept. It was it, so um, wasn't quite didn't quite resolve it. I think, but we needed to get it in front of you. It's a, just as simple to keep it. If that's the that's the way. Does it have any value? I, to me, it, Jonathan, looking at the comments in there, it didn't seem like it had too much value. But you did, someone did bring up shifting the contents to other another policy regarding the advertising piece. The advertising piece, I those those two pair small sections. I could there is a separate ad, uh, policy on advertising in the three thousand three. I could shift those over and put them elsewhere. It's just that these are the instruction office policies, and I think the intent was to limit advertisements placing advertisements in front of kids yeah. um with the way we but we don't control television if we're using that for television we can't control whether it's commercials yeah so it's so you're using the tvs though are they are they okay no, i don't know i don't see advertisements well, that there's a youtube video well yeah. you need that but that on tv but yeah okay yeah, yeah, yeah so that yeah that ends after five minutes the seconds yeah yeah all right other authorized services, we're going to keep that policy. Uh, the last one, which generated a, a lot of discussion, was field trips and interscholastic trips. So we met this afternoon, myself, Ms. Swan, and Rick, to talk about this. Um, in some ways, because I wasn't quite sure of the conversations that happened before, because I wasn't present for those. However, we did um look at a sample policy from another district and we had definitely understood where you were coming from with the question because of the way it was not differentiated in our current policy and then when i added some of the language from theory one into our current policy it kind of magnified it a little bit and focused everything on field trips but in reality we could change it to have field trips separate like curriculum based field trips so that the definition of field trips really focuses just on the curriculum based ones as opposed to interscholastic and the other three categories of trips which aren't necessarily considered field trips in a traditional sense what it reminded me of as i was explaining is it really reminded me of discussions that we had throughout the years of the transportation <clears throat> contract and the way the transportation contract outlines trips trips trip drivers and other things like that so ultimately we decided that to honor the discussion that took place we would keep the policy as is for now because we're spent the district itself is aware of the interpretations and everything that's happening in the existing policy and then reach out to our attorneys to talk more about incorporating whatever guidance you were given during that meeting and making any changes and potentially broader based changes to the policy itself to further delineate between those field trips with the which are curricular, which the district does pay for, versus non-curricular extra classroom activity. Extra class. It's easier. It's easier than trying to figure out the definition of interscholastic. You know, all of those other things. Further outlining those definitions and then bringing that policy back at a future time. I just wanted our policy to match the our fiscal discussion. Yeah, yeah. Right. And yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, right. we we completely understood where you're going up with and mm -hmm. to make sure that our language is aligned with our practices. Um, and so as as Jonathan just said, we we want to consult with BSK, but we think that there are some policies that we can use as an exemplar that get to us that allow us to individualize in this area. So we'll we'll be circling back and bringing this back. All right, uh, that was it. There's no more questions. So let's talk a little bit about you know the process with this, just so that we are doing it very efficiently and we're Consistent. all communicating under under the same umbrella. Because personally, what what I do, and this doesn't mean it's the right way, but um, when Jonathan sends the emails on Friday, okay, and he lists each individual policy. I then go off that email and I go into the OneNote and I read the policies usually on the weekend, Saturday, Sunday. I like to go to that because I get to see cabinet's responses or comments, any that Jonathan had, Tim O'Connor, and all of us. You know, I look at those comments and it helps me to think about those policies. 
to be honest with you, and I mentioned this to Kristen today after you reached out, Leah, I had a conversation with Kristen about this, is that when it comes to me in an email and that attachment is there, I don't even open that. And yeah, I don't, I don't get did. into, <laughs> I don't get into my questions or comments in email because I'm going to be really honest with you. With my schedule during the day, teaching seven classes with five minutes in between with elementary kids, um, for me to go in and go through an email chain about people's comments about policies, I'm not going to be very effective. You know, so that's I go into the OneNote knowing that hey, I'm going to set some time aside in my schedule going in one note and do a thorough job or a dashboard approach so yeah like yeah because like yeah. you had comments in there Lori, you provide a lot of feedback leo you provide a lot of feedback in there we all do cabinet does and employees that directly relate with those policies so i'm kind of thinking if we eliminate email communication about our thoughts about policies and go into the one note and use that as our is our way to give comments and feedback when we're doing policy review, yeah. that might make it more consistent. So if Jonathan has 12 policies for us on a Thursday afternoon or a Friday morning. Can I just back up on that? Go ahead, yeah, please do. We've discussed earlier in this process the possibility of receiving the policies a little more in advance than what we have been receiving mm -hmm. them. This past time, it's just getting to be a lot of reading over the weekend. Yeah. And I'm discovering that I just don't have the time right now to devote an entire weekend to preparing for a board meeting and reading policies and some of the other volunteer obligations that we have with this board. Right. So if there's any way we can get back to backing it up a few days or giving it to us on an off week, you know, where we have an extra week in mm -hmm. between, I would really appreciate it. Yeah, I would, I would, I would have to concur with that, Lori. I think, I, I think using the OneNote is a is a great tool. Like you said, Greg, we can see everybody else's comments. Uh, it it consolidates everything right there for Jonathan and whoever else is having to put hands on this stuff. But I agree, Lori. Um, you know, between a Friday and a Tuesday, <laughs> there's a lot of things that are going on, and it would be good if we could get a get a get maybe two Fridays in a on the way to the Tuesday and stuff. So Jonathan, with that, with that feedback and based on the work that you're doing with this, could you provide us those policies on and off week? So to give us more time so that we're not on a Friday getting our board pack in mm -hmm. and policy. So, you know, a Friday on and off week, get it so that we have more time to go through it and sit through it. Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah, or even the Monday or Tuesday of the week ahead of our next board meeting, just a little bit more time than just the weekend. Yeah, and it, it, I apologize for that. It's really just come down to all the other things of trying to balance right. with capital yeah. project. And Absolutely. Yeah, no, task force. we understand See, entirely, but, but then when it all comes right. to us. And, and, and I, I, know, I, I know, I know, I know. Sorry, but I'm just going to say, and I hope the, the board could appreciate this. If we can't make that deadline, then we'll just let you know. Because I think that that's exactly what has been happening is that we wanted to stay true to this process and try to get through. Um, but I think with the end of the year, with situations that have occurred on campus, with the other priorities, if we can't, then I hope the board would understand and say we're going to push off. A little. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Where are we, Jonathan? Start to finish. And where are we? What, what point are we? What percent group? 98, 99. Oh, roll mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, this really was pulling the last, right. almost all of the last stragglers together. The, the Title IX policy that Jamie and I were working on, we have to work, I have to work with Tim on the attendance, uh, attendance policy, or you know, it's in the 7,000 series. It's just trying to fit with that one, fit three policies in, roll it into one. So there's only a couple policies left. Um, I spent a weekend going through everything to make sure that policies have come to you, policies are going to ERE 1, and will be coming back to us in a manual form. At that point, I have to talk with Kristen and Cabinet about how we look at any policies that have come up since, because this was a 2019 manual. 
So there have been some other policies that come out that have come out from Erie One. Um, Erie One reached out the other day and gave me two options. I still have to meet with administration as to how we incorporate those in to our discussions so the board can review those. It'll be to the point where we could probably just take the manual, adopt it, and then come back and review all the other ones, or they'll incorporate the new policies into the manual. So there we're almost done. Okay. So it's been three years, let's be clear. clear going yeah. forward, <laughs> you'll give us just the list of the policy numbers that we're yeah. going to review. We will each go into the policy notebook and review the policy in there and make our comments in there. Does, does that work with everybody? Okay. Yeah. 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 And also to summarize, we'll get it a little bit more in advance, but if we don't get it, or we move on. Right. We move on because there might be situations where we might not get them. We just move on. So and there's a final draft copy. Are we seeing those policies again before it goes to print? We're gonna read them all over again. Well, I've only been on the board a year, so okay. there's been two years of policy. <laughs> that I'm just curious as to is I'm not asking to relitigate them. I'm asking, is there a final has there been is the proposed like we have a proposed policy we have a discussion what goes to print if if there's been no, no. alterations no. No. <laughs> if there's been no alterations discussed here the policy that i sent to you which is, is often in the, in the one note as final draft that is going to your one and if there was discussion here We've got a couple that we either have to revisit or have discussions about based on questions that have come up. Okay. Those are going to be coming back to us. They will, yeah, we'll need to have more further discussion either in open session or in front of the line. My suggestion, let us reach out to both seats one. And we've extended this to Mike's point into a third year. It's supposed to be two. Um, we have one more board meeting. I think we would wrap it up. Let us reach out to both seats uh, or theory one to determine what the final process is because my sense is a little bit different. My sense is we're gonna ask them to print it. And then we know that we still have some policies to look at, we'll bring those forward because we're not part of that service anymore unless we extend it one more year. Okay, my concern though, is if we've had discussion about a policy and I'm reading a proposed policy and that proposed policy went to print without any changes, then I don't know why we bothered having a discussion. If, if I, if I piggyback off what Rick said, I think he means having the print manual, but not necessarily adopting it. Yeah. Having another chance to review the contents. I'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Listen, I'm not asking to I'm not asking to relitigate Paul. That's not what I'm asking. I'm not, just saying that if we've had a discussion. I get it, but the fact of the matter is we have one board meeting left. The the plan was to have all of this wrapped up, um, get it processed. So we either need to reach out that's why I'm suggesting reach out to your one. We either have to pay for another year or we get it oh, wrapped up. We're trying up. to wrap it up because if we don't, we have to pay for another year. Right. Right. So, so we get so we get yeah. it wrapped up. And I understand what you're saying. Yeah. But then knowing those, we still um, we bring it forward and then we talk about the changes or the ones that we had discussion on. So fact story is our policies were a decade old. We decided to go through this review process, which was long overdue. And there was a lot of evolution of the policies. And the truth is, is we could make this into an ongoing thing for the rest of our lives here. Because, you know, the things we did three years ago could quite honestly have evolved now. But we, we made a lot of progress in three years. I'm not disagreeing with that. What I'm saying is if you've had a discussion about a policy because there was concerns. How's what ends up being I accidentally adopted. How's the it memorialized? Uh, I don't want that policy now to just be some... The, you know what I mean? The previous proposed you know, policy. So, Leah, let's, oh, let's get feedback from Area One Boces. Because even in my own mind, like one of the questions I would say to Area One Boces is if, if we print these policies and we're not formally adopting, like we pull the ones, Jonathan knows which ones we have to circle back to. We pull those, we can adopt the ones that the board just says, I don't have a problem with this. So, you've got 90% adopted. We're circling back to ones that we've got to come back and recircle. But let us 
let us talk with area one BOCES to get their guidance in regards to this. Okay. okay. I just don't want to, I, what I don't want to do is adopt policies that people have spent time on that then that don't you reflect, know we that don't reflect what was done. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If we have to go one more year. I okay. I I don't necessarily think we have to go one more year. I think um, Jonathan helped me, but I thought we were going to kind of establish our own kind of drumbeat of going through these things on a regular basis to try and keep them updated versus going 10, 12, 15 years before we look at them again. Is that did I misinterpret right. something? Oh, you did not misinterpret anything. That was the conversation. Even if we were on, you know, an eight-year cycle of because there's eight thousand, there's eight series sure. of policies or small. So and then so then we could start with those policies that may still have some question marks in them as our next year's thing, but we're not having to pay Erie One to be engaged with us on it. I think we're I think we're well versed enough at this point in time that we can do this on our own. And are we really going to have them print this thing? Please tell me no. And we're just right. getting electronic copies. Or electronic. Uh, when we started, they sent me like five copies, hard copy. And oh, God, no. Please tell them not to do that. And I didn't ask for it. I tried to tell. Like literally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have them in my own. Oh, dear Lord. So well, they I, become I, door stoppers. So. Intent is going to be getting this all up on the website. So I'll have to work with Marcy to make these all accessible to our staff because essentially we would need to move away from what the old style was. People would send out paper copies and people would, and everybody would have to put it in their binder. Yeah, we, no. We have it on the website. It's continually updated. You can search, uh, search options, right? I'm sure. There's yeah. no point in having a paper copy. No. no. My goodness, it's 2022 people. Yeah, I, I brought my binder back a couple of years ago. Gave it to Marcy as an antique. So. Okay, any, any further questions or thoughts? No. Everyone clear? Yes, Gary, all set? All set, man, thanks. Thank you, sir. Okay, um, I have to... Uh, Apologize um, when we did board reports because Gary wasn't sitting at the table. I forgot to ask <laughs> if he had any reports, and he was persistent to text me that. So if you saw me texting, I said, Sorry, I'll circle back to you. I usually don't text during board meetings, but when he said you blew me off, um, I come back to you. So, Gary, I apologize for that. Uh, yeah. I well, you I just wanted to give. Give a little levity for you there. No, I'm good, man. I just, I, you know, thank you for all the comments about MCSBA. You know, uh, I hope everybody supports Amy West as our new president. And of course, Amy Thomas as our new executive director. So uh, please, uh, when you get a chance, drop them both a note and stuff. Thank you, Gary. Thanks. Certainly. Meeting evaluation, any comments? Thank you to the high school student for coming tonight. We continue to look forward to more visitors at our board meetings. Really appreciate that. Jamie, do we have collective negotiations to discuss this evening or not? In executives, non representative. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I mean, not negotiations. Well, what was the question? I'm sorry. I was just asking Jamie. I'm about to make a motion to move into executive session. I want to make sure we're not discussing collective negotiations with any of our Copy that. All right. Thank you. We're good. Okay. I'd like to make a motion that we enter executive session for the purpose of discussing the employment <laughs> history of particular persons, as well as to discuss an appeal of a superintendent's hearing. Yeah. Second, David, all in favor? Gary? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, can you still do that thing where you have to sign? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Go ahead. Here.